Hey, we're in this series called This Is Us, and we started it last week. We're talking about the family. So whether you're single, whether you're engaged, married with no children, or married with children, this series is going to encourage you. Because we understand that you might be in some spectrum of like relational life where it's probably very exciting and thriving and your marriage is great and your relationship with your children and everything is soaring. And some of you might walk in here barely making it. And we understand that. And hearing this stuff is, is tough. But I want you to know that our staff is praying for you. Our B team is praying for you. We have people here praying for you because we truly believe that in the name of Jesus, when you walk out of these doors, you'll be more encouraged not just about your relationship with Jesus, but what Jesus can do in your relationship with your spouse and with your kids. Amen? Amen. And so to, today we're going to be talking about marriage. Just want to give you that recap that we're going to go into there. But we want to talk about last week just for a minute because I want to remind you guys that in this whole series called This Is Us, we are actually wanting you guys to build a home with a God-given passion. So let's put up this picture from last week. Can you put up that picture from last week, please? Okay. So we want to remind you that throughout this series, and for as long as you're living, pray. Husbands, pray for your wives. Wives, pray for your husbands. Husbands, pray for your kids. Kids, pray for dad. Wives, pray for your kids. Kids, pray for mom. Constantly be praying for one another. And the other thing is, as a family, partner together in the gospel. Create a bigger vision of what Jesus wants to do in and through your family. Lastly is, keep the right perspective. Keep the right perspective. It means just to put Jesus at the centerpiece of your life, at the centerpiece of your marriage, at the centerpiece of your parenting. That he always is the one you look to on, and, and look to when you have to make a decision on how to act how to react, and how, how, how to show love, and how to show grace, and how to show mercy. I mean, Jesus is the one you want to make sure you go to all the time and teach your family to do the same thing, so we want to keep the right perspective. But as we talk about marriage today, i got to say something. I love marriage. I love weddings. love going to weddings. It's so beautiful, isn't it? But here's the thing about marriage that, that kind of breaks my heart a bit. Because the, the, the concept of a marriage is beautiful, right? It, it's, a, it's a man and a woman looking at each other and saying, hey, we're going to love each other to the very end. Till death do us part. That's really beautiful. That's very encouraging. And so <coughs> one of the things that I've realized, though, is that lately, and we all would agree with this, that marriage is kind of, well, 50-50, isn't it? So many people get divorced. What is it, 50% of marriages get divorced? And that's tough to know that a marriage, you could flip a coin and maybe that's wherever that coin falls is where that marriage goes. And if you're not, if you're not a Christian this morning, I got to tell you something from the Christian community that I'm sorry. I'm sorry that also that Christians kind of fall into that bucket too. And as Christians, we, ought to have, we should have done a way better job at protecting marriages, to show the world just how much Jesus loves us, because that's what our marriage does. Is sh by the way we love one another in our marriage, the way Jesus is reflecting how Jesus loves us, and we get to show that out to the world, and we should have done a better job with that. But in a marriage, you have two people loving each other, but like I said, then why is the divorce rate so high, right? Well, could it be maybe that people just doesn't, don't have the same value for commitment and contracts and stuff like that that People should. Because think about it. You go to a cell phone company. You don't like the cell phone company. You want to break your commitment. You could just break it, pay some money, you know, and go to the next person. And nowadays, other cell phone companies will pay for you, will pay the fee so that you can move over to their company. Isn't that crazy how that works? And lately, you could just pay to get out of a contract, deal with a little bit of pain, but you, you can make it through the other side, and that's what our culture's been like is saying, hey, just you could break your commitments, you could break your contracts. But marriage, from a Christian perspective, and here's the difference, because look, here's the similarities between a non-Christian marriage and a Christian marriage, okay? They both are saying to one another, there's, there's a husband and a wife, both saying to one another, I'm going to commit to you my entire life. 
till death do us part. But where the Christian marriage takes a huge turn, and what makes it the biggest difference is that a husband is also making a commitment to Jesus. And the wife is making a commitment to Jesus, saying, Jesus, we promise you that we're going to be in love with you. And as we promise that we're going to be in love with you, we're also promising that we're going to be in love with each other. And that commitment to Jesus changes the, the whole gamut of marriage, changes everything about it, because we know who's really leading us. Now, in the Bible, when it talks about making a promise, it uses this word covenant. Covenant. Now, today we don't use the word covenant. Because if I come to you and say, hey, would you like to make a covenant with me? Because of the spiritual and religious overtones, you're going to think, are we going to do a ceremony? Do we have to sacrifice an animal? Do I have to hand you my child? Right? There is Because the, nobody uses the word covenant. Right? It's just too weird. But throughout the Bible, God is saying, I've made a covenant with you. And what God is saying, say, I am making a promise with you, that I'm going to be committed to you, that I'm going to give my life to you. And we actually see a, an example of a covenant in Genesis 15. And God made a covenant with Abraham. It's actually pretty cool how you see this, how, how we take this, what happened in Genesis 15, and we took it to, to highlight and elevate the concept of marriage. So in Genesis 15, you have Abraham talking to God, and Abraham was discouraged about a lot of things, and God said, hey, 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 I'm going to make a promise to you. I'm going to make a covenant to you, let you know that what, what I said will come true, and that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to fulfill my end of this deal. And so, Abraham, I need you to cut two, I need you to cut a bunch of animals and cut them in half and create an aisle for me. Later on that evening, God shows up with a bull, as, represented as a bull, with fire on it and then a flaming torch. And the fire there represents the presence of God and it's coming closer to Abraham. Now, Abraham would totally have understood what this all meant. Because what God was doing, God was using a Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian contract ritual. He just removed all the stuff that's about worshiping other gods. And he took the emphasis of the ritual that Moses, I mean, that Abraham needed to know. And here's the emphasis. That as God was representative in those flaming devices and coming down the aisle between these two animals that are dead. What God is saying to Abraham is like, Abraham, if I break this covenant, may I be dead just like these animals. <sighs> See, to Moses, to Abraham, why am I calling him Moses today? Uh, to Abraham, this would have been mind-blowing. Why? Because no other God, no other more powerful supreme being would put himself in that kind of place to say to a lesser being that I, if I break this covenant, I am better off dead. See, what Abraham saw from God was pursuit, was commitment, was true love. And don't we see the same in Jesus? That Jesus made a promise to us to live for us, to die for us. And he said, because I love you so much, I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to die to give you life. Wow. And God held up his end of the bargain, didn't he? He, he fulfilled his promise to Abraham. Now, the Christian community took this concept of covenant and brought it to the marriage ceremony to elevate the seriousness of marriage. Because here's what we need to know. A Christian marriage is a covenantal relationship. A Christian marriage is a covenantal relationship. It, what, changes, what changes a Christian marriage from a non-Christian marriage is this. Is Jesus. Is Jesus. So let us, let us demonstrate. Here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a wedding ceremony. And you're going to represent the bride side. You're going to represent the groom side. And everybody needs to participate. Can everybody participate? Yes. 
Okay, thank you for like the three of you that said yes. Awesome, we're ready. So supportive of our uh, married couple here. All right, so let's give it up for the groom. Ba -dum -ba -dum, ba -dum -ba -dum. Come on up, bud. This is Nick. You've seen him shake hands and wave at you and tell you where to sit. So Nick is our groom. Now, in the whole marriage ceremony, Nick would have walked down and he's standing here with me. We're having a conversation. He's smiling. He can't wait to see his soon-to-be wife. But the fact that he walked down this aisle, what he is saying in front of God, in front of everybody, in front of his family and her family, and what he's saying to her is that I'm going to forsake all for you. And if I break my promise to God and to her, my future wife, may I be dead like these animals. And, was that funny? <laughs> okay, good. I was like, why are they laughing? I'm like, that's a serious point. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Um, but here's the, here's the thing. He's also saying, here's what he's also saying, that people in my family, even my own kids, my mom and dad, people in her family, her crazy uncles, right? Her mom and dad will not come in the way of the promise that I made to God and to her to stay together. Mm -hmm. Oh, also, his dreams, his passions, his desires, his career do not come in the way of the covenant that he made before God, you all, and her. It's pretty powerful stuff. So now, let's have the bride. Come on down, bride. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We got some music, thank you. Everybody stand, stand. Stand, come on guys, stand, here she is. Come on down, yes. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, all right, you guys, uh, act like you love each other, hold hands. Oh, this is great. All right, so just keep staring at each other and smile. Uh, I'll make this as less, at least awkward as possible. You all could be seated now, that's what I would say, right? All right, so notice what Rachel did. She walked down the aisle. She's making the same promise to, to God, to Nick, to everybody, and to everybody else saying that if I break this covenant with him, may I be dead just like these animals. See the, see the symbolism there? And here, here's the other thing. She's also saying that, hey, nothing comes in between my relationship with Jesus and Nick. Not his family, not my family, not my dreams, not my passions, not my career. Because if any of those things begin to interrupt my promise to God that I made, that she made to him, may I be like those dead animals. It's serious stuff. Serious stuff. Now, here's the other thing. <coughs> what, 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 why, what I find so amazing about this is that as they're making their promise to Jesus, they're also acknowledging, you know what, Jesus, because you've given your life to me, I'm going to give my life to him. And he's saying, because you've given your life to me, I'm going to give my life to her. When you realize that the covenant relationship is doing is saying, we're going to promise God and one another. And this guy named Tim Keller wrote a book called Real Marriage. It's a great book. Go get it. And if you want, there's an eight-part teaching series on it. Email me, and I'll send it to you, okay? But he says something profound in the book. He says that if when a married couple, if they break faith with one another, they're simultaneously breaking faith with God. That's heavy. Now, here's what I know is that for some of you here today, it wasn't your choice to have this vow broken somebody else's and I just want to say I'm sorry and I want to say that God is thinking of you and that your story isn't over and we have people at our church that are praying for you and so what I want to do is just encourage you guys to see the seriousness of a marriage covenant and so at the end I would say by the something with me in Florida and I'm a pastor and I can say a bunch of stuff and I'll pronounce you husband and I make kids a bride Woo! Didn't they do great? Good job, guys. 
So, here's the thing about marriage that we all know. What happened up here was the easiest day of any marriage, wasn't it? Easiest day. I mean, I rem- look, I remember seeing Stephanie. Man, she was she's beautiful. She was just stunning. I was 10 pounds lighter. It was amazing. <laughs> Man, she looked amazing and still does. And you know what we do every year? And I encourage all young couples to do this. I encourage you guys, pay money for the videographer. Sacrifice food, sacrifice everything else, pay money for the videographer. You know why? Because every year, Stephanie and I watch our wedding video. And we just get filled with nostalgia and filled with joy. And then we say things like, what was I wearing? Why did we choose that color scheme? We just have a lot of fun. But it was just still the easiest day. The easiest moment of my marriage was the day I said I do. And every day since, here's what we need to realize is this, is that love is a decision. Love is a decision. Man, this is hard because you know what? We're told that love is a feeling, it's an emotion. And yes, it is. But when you say love is a decision, you're, you're, listen, listen, you're you're reflecting what Jesus did to you because Jesus said, look, I love you And I'm committed to you till the very end. Till the very end. And you don't just fall in love and fall out of love. Because we like to say that because it's romantic. But it also releases us from responsibility. And here's the thing about the show, This Is Us. There was an episode where Jack goes into this break room. Jack, the dad of the show. If you haven't seen the show, you can go watch it. And it's about this family, and this dad walks into the break room to see his friend Miguel flirting with the secretary. When the secretary leaves, Jack calls out his friends like, Miguel, what are you doing? You're married. Then Jack begins to give him all these reasons as to why things haven't been working in their marriage. And here's the thing that Jack does. Jack points at him and says, don't tell me. Don't tell me you fell out of love. See what that show was highlighting in that scene is that love is a decision. That you gotta fight for it. That you gotta decide, I'm gonna build my home on love and on God's love. In Ephesians 5 21, the Apostle Paul writes and says this submitting to one another in fear and reverence for Christ. That the reason why you decide, husbands, to love your wives, wives, to love your husbands, the reason why you decide, even when you don't want to, is because, you know what? Jesus loved me. He's crazy in love with me. And, I have, and I've done things to give Jesus every reason to not love me, and yet he still does because he's made a decision to do it. And therefore, I am going to make a decision to love my wife and and I'm going to make, the wives will say, I'm going to make a decision to love my husband. And this word submitting is what you're saying in the marriage. Saying, I'm giving everything to you. And, and interesting, because this is a military word, the way Paul was writing it, is that a soldier will submit his life, his schedule, his plans for his platoon, for his captain, for his army, for his peers. And the husband, what he's saying, the way he's going to submit He's saying, I'm going to give my life to you. That if there's a sword to fall on, the husband would get in the way and fall on the sword. That the husband would die just like Christ died for us. And the wives are saying, I'm going to submit to my husband. I know that's not a popular word, but if the husband is submitting to us, and the only difference in wording and phraseology is saying that he's going to die to us, He's going to die to his wife. That the wife is saying, I'm going to submit to your leadership because if you're willing to die for me, I could follow that. I could follow that kind of leadership. It's pretty special when you see it that way. And that God wants to build a home on love and explode it. And explode the home with his love, with his grace, and making it thrive. 
So there's three types of love that you want to build a home with. The first one is agape love. You read in the Bible, is agape love, and that's unconditional love. It's the unconditional love God has for us. I was a small group on Wednesday, and somebody shared with us a story about how God shows his love to this person. And this person was saying, you know how God tells me he loves me? What he does is he reminds me about how often and how how often I don't love God and how incapable I am to love God. That even at our best, every single one of us, we don't love God, we don't love God the way he loves us. And listen, we all fail at loving God the way we should. But yet God in his mercy and in his love for us, not only does he give us strength to love him, he's also fully aware that when we decide to turn our backs, he never turns his back on us. And when you decide to build your home on unconditional love, you're saying, we're not turning our backs on each other. Because there are days when you're frustrating, when I don't want to love you, when you're challenging, when you're difficult, when things are unfair, and yet I'm choosing not to turn my back. And when you have Jesus as the centerpiece of your perspective in your, in your marriage, he's going to fill you with that power and grace to show unconditional love because he showed it to you. He showed it to you. The second one is phileo, which is you read the second type of love in the Bible and it's friendship love. That you guys enjoy each other. Because before you had kids, you guys were friends. Right? Just yesterday, I wanted, wanted to talk to Stephanie and I'm like, hey baby, come on out. I just wanted to hang out with you for a minute. Before my mom came over for dinner, for Mother's Day dinner and everything, and Stephanie came out, and we sat on the, on the couch, we started talking. And, like, we had about maybe two to three minutes of, like, fun, fun time of talking before Madeline comes in, and she, my daughter, she starts knocking on the, and it's like glass, and so we see her, she, like, it's like, let her, you know, she's like, the door, the door. So we let her in, and then she goes and plays in the corner, and then she gets mad at us when we stare at her. It's like, you're, you're in our space, you do know that, right? No, you know, no longer than like 30 seconds later, the boys all come out, say, hey, 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 they just wanted to be around us. And we're like, well, at least we had fun for three minutes, <laughs> right? But see, when you have this unconditional love, and that meter's always going up, you're fighting for that love. You're showing that kind of love. The friendship love follows. I mean, figure it out. Look, look. Let me tell you this. If you could trust Jesus to rescue your soul out of hell and create the ever-expanding universe, then you could trust him to help you figure out how to be friends with your spouse. Husbands, and you get on your knees and you think about, how can I be friends with my wife? How can I be more friends with my wife? Jesus, help me. And he'll show you. Wives, he'll show you how to be friends again with your husband. And you know what? Thank God for Netflix. Let's be real. And Hulu. Put the kids to bed. 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Get them in. Hang out. Watch your favorite show. Play a board game. Have fun. Because that's your friend. Talk to each other. Because what ends up happening is when you got this unconditional love in a positive, and you put deposits in it, and you put deposits into the phileo love, then you got the next one, which is eros, which is physical love. And it's as if God, I mean, God is so brilliant. He knew that once we have the unconditional love moving forward and north, and there's deposits in there, and we have the friendship love and deposits in there, he was going to give us physical love as like, hey, this is just a blessing for these two. Like, I, I just wanted to gift you with this. Because, husbands, the reality is, as much as we think, if we just have a lot of this love, right, the physical love, everything would be great. But we know that this is just a gift. And we protect this physical love within our marriage. No one else gets that kind of love that, you, that a husband and wife give to one another. And I would even have to say, not just in the physical, just to think about this, but also emotional. That the emotional attachment is there as well. 
But when these three types of love are functioning and are thriving and are moving north and you're submitting your, your way of loving to Jesus and he's filling you with knowledge and understanding and energy to love your spouse, you begin to realize something about your marriage and it's this, and this is the core idea for this morning, is that your marriage is bigger than you. That your marriage is bigger than you. It's bigger than you. See, in a non-Christian marriage, it's just two people saying, yeah, my marriage is, not, is, is bigger than me. I get it because I'm supposed to give my life to my wife and, 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 and the wife will give her, her, her life to the husband and, and then, then they live for the kids and it's bigger than them. And I, I get it. I understand. It is bigger than them. But when you throw Jesus in the mix, it doesn't just stay within your home because to Jesus, every soul matters. Every human being matters to God. And he wants your marriage to reflect his love and offer hope to others. Check this out, what Paul writes in Ephesians 5. He says this in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. So in Ephesians 5, Paul is writing this whole thing about how to live in the, with the Holy Spirit and what it's like to live with the Holy Spirit. Then he breaks into this marriage analogy and this is why he's doing it. He's saying this. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but, but I am talking about Christ and the church. He is using marriage as an analogy to Christ and the church. That means that as a married couple... You're supposed to reflect the sacrifices that Christ made for the church. And as the church is supposed, to, as, as America, but the church is being the church, is serving, it's loving, and expressing the ways of Jesus into this world. We as married couple get to show both of those identities to the world. So that wives, when you're hanging out with your girlfriends and you start talking, because that's what wives and girlfriends do, they talk, right? And one of you mentioned something about your husband and you say, man, I noticed that you and your husband, like your husband really lets you soar with your dreams and your passions. He really believes in you. And wives, this is your opportunity to say, well, you know, we work at it. It's hard. But I know my husband loves Jesus. And he made a covenant to Jesus, a promise to Jesus and that promise that he made to Jesus was also given to me, that he said he's never going to leave me, that he's going to pursue me, that he's going to love me, that he's going to elevate my dreams and passions. He's going to lay down his life for me. It's because of my husband's love for Jesus. And then what do you think that's going to do? It opens the opportunity for someone to feel like, wow, maybe God could love me this way too. I need Jesus in my marriage. I need Jesus in my life. Husbands, you're hanging out with your friends. You're watching a game. And the only time you talk, you really talk is during the timeouts, right? It's like, no talking during timeouts and commercials. That's the time. Maybe you're hanging out with one of your friends, and suddenly if one of your friends dropped this line. It's like, man, how, how could you still be cool with your wife? Like, how do you guys still love each other? Like, how do you guys aren't annoyed at each other? Like, what is it about you two? You as the husband gets to say, well, you know, we fight for this. It's not easy. We fight. It's a fight every day. It's a, I, love is a decision. And uh, my wife's committed her life to Jesus. I've committed my, wife, my life to Jesus. And because we commit our lives to Christ, he gives us the strength to love one another. That I can still be friends with my wife. That I love her unconditionally. And that she loves me. Maybe that will allow your friend to say, man, I hope Jesus could do that for me too. See, your marriage is bigger than you. Your marriage is bigger than you. There are people that need the hope of Jesus Christ and your marriage is God's gift to those people that you get to restore people's lives through the power of Jesus in your marriage so they could find hope. They could find salvation. They 
you can find Jesus and may your marriage, guys, listen, listen, when we decide to build our home with the God-given passion, we make love a decision and we realize it's a covenant that cannot be broken, our marriages will help people believe in Jesus, belong to Jesus, become like Jesus, and live beyond themselves like Jesus. Amen? And then what we're going to do right now is something really cool. We're going to have one of our elders and his wife come and pray for us because we understand that um, there's a lot of, a lot of you uh, that come in here, you either you know of marriages that aren't doing well. And maybe your marriage is the one that's not doing well. Some of you are thriving and God's protecting your marriage and you're fighting for it. You're fighting for it. Well, you know what? We want to pray for you too that you continue to fight. To continue to fight. And for all of you that are single, and here's what I want you to here's what I would like you to do. I would like you to think of a marriage to pray for right now. Think of a marriage to pray for. And husbands and wives, if you can, just hold hands as Joe and Nancy uh, pray for you guys. Thank you. So let, let's pray. We, Father, we thank you for your love for us. It is a covenant that we've made with you first and foremost, and when, then with one another. We know that every day is a struggle. We know that spiritual warfare comes into our midst throughout the day, causing us to, to want to do all manner of things. Um, but we trust in you. We know your love. We count on your love. We need your love. And with you, all things are possible. We pray that our lives would model Christ, that you would be seen in and through us. We ask your blessing today especially on those who are struggling, who are hurting, um, and who need a special touch from you today that only you can satisfy, that you can provide. I thank you for the body of Christ and for the love that we get to show one another as we come alongside each other, helping bearing one another's burdens and showing your love to us in real and practical ways. I pray for each one that's here today. And I thank you for my wife. I thank you for my children and for the family that you have given us. We are truly blessed. And everything about us is yours. May we honor you with every breath that we take. May your name be exalted. And I thank you for this. Bless each one that's here today. I thank you for the mothers that are here today and the grandmothers. How special they are and how important they are in our lives. And we praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.